Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Colin Busby, Research Director of the IRPP, and I would like to begin by acknowledging that the IRPP's office is located on unceded Indigenous lands. I'm broadcasting to you from Chuchage, Montreal, which is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. The Ganyangahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which um, I'm broadcasting to you from today. So today we have a wonderful panel of leading researchers and operators on food banks in, in Canada. The panel is going to speak to some new research initiatives into food bank users in Canada, the role of government income support programs and food bank users, and what they see as the major challenges facing food banks today. Our panel is made up of four wonderful guests. Um, first is, is Martin Dooley, Professor Emeritus of Economics at Master University. Welcome, Martin. Thank you very much. It's very good to be here with you. Next is Joanne Santucci, CEO of Hamilton Foodshare. Welcome, Joanne. Welcome, Colin. Thank you so much for being here. <clears throat> Richard Mattern, Research Director at Food Banks Canada. Welcome, Richard. Hello, thank you, and thank you for having me. And Vishal Khanna, co-founder of Saidam Food Bank. Thank you. Thanks for having me. One of our guests today, Laurie O'Connor, um, you know, who's with the Saskatoon Food Bank, unfortunately could not be with us today. But thanks everyone for being here. Um, I want to remind everyone what Ricardo said at the beginning, and that's we're going to try to get to as many questions as we can from the audience. Um, but you keep those questions short and concise, and we'll get through as many of them as we can after everyone's done their presentations. So but for the first word on the topic on uh, today's webinar, however, I'm going to turn it over to you, Martin, to talk about all your new and exciting research. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be sharing a series of slides with you now. So if you could start the slides, please. The title of our report is The Poorest of the Poor, which low-income households use food banks and how often. This is an analysis using data from the Hamilton Food Share Network, which is a network of all major food banks in Hamilton, and the 2016 uh, Census Low-Income Population uh, for Hamilton. There's four authors uh, besides myself. There's Ruby Bachma, Arthur Sweetman, and Melody Yin, all from McMaster University Department of Economics. And we're very grateful for the support offered by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council and McMaster University. Okay, next slide, please. Food banks in Canada go way back to 1981 when the first one was opened in uh, Edmonton. They are very widely used still, as I'm sure you all know, the need is driven by, among other factors, inadequate income and rising prices for necessities. Food Banks Canada reported that in March 2021, the 2,300 plus food banks in the country had 1,300,000 visitors of whom one third were children. And this is a 20% increase over uh, the two year uh, period since March 2019. Food banks deal with many issues besides just food. The literature shows that adults in food insecure households experience poor mental and physical health, greater stress and more chronic conditions. Children in food insecure households have increased behavioral problems, including ADD, depression, poor school performance, and they have subsequent health disparities and poverty in, in later life. Next slide, please. The key questions we're asking in our report is which low-income households visit food banks, what proportion of food bank users are regular clients, and what proportion use this service only briefly, what proportion of the low-income population uses food banks, how does the income of food bank households compare with the income of uh, uh, low-income households that do not use food banks, and is the physical location of food banks a challenge for the low-income population? Answers to these questions are needed by many groups. They're needed by policy analysts, politicians, food bank administrators, funders, uh, et cetera. Next slide, please. The two data sources we're using are, first of all, data, administrative data from Hamilton Food Chair for four years, 2015 through uh, 2018. 
future research will add another three years onto our, our data set. We have extensive data. We believe the most extensive available in Canada right now. We have data on income expenditures and demographic characteristics of all food bank users, including all members of their household that use food from the food bank. The second data source is the 2016 Statistics Canada profile data for low income households in Hamilton. And the, uh, the low income line that we're using is the before tax low income measure. And virtually all uh, food bank households in Hamilton have income below, below that measure. The key data challenge we face uh, from our food bank data is that we don't know uh, what is the situation of our users when they don't come to a food bank. And of course, we have no easy way of, of dealing with that issue. Um, we try as best we can, but that is an obvious uh, challenge we have to deal with. Next slide, please. Major findings. One third of low income households in Hamilton use a food bank at least once a year. The key variable associated with food bank use is income. Gross income is about 50% lower in food bank households than in the average low income family, regardless of household size. That is why we say food bank users are the poorest of the poor. Next slide, please. The most common type of food bank household is a single person living alone, but compared to all low income households, food bank use is proportionally much higher among households with children. Third, food bank users rely more heavily on transfers, especially Ontario disability support payments and Ontario Works, which is social assistance in Ontario, and less heavily on employment income than does the average low income household. And then finally, we found that the physical location of food banks does not play an important role in determining which low income households use food banks. Okay, next slide, please. This is figure one, and the orange bars show the distribution of food bank households by household type. And as you can see on the far left, almost half of households are individuals living alone. Uh, the next biggest group is lone parents who constitute about one quarter uh, food bank households followed by uh, married uh, common law couples with children and then childless couples. If you look at the purple uh, bars though, they show you what's the percentage of all low-income households that use a food bank. And here the situation changes. Individuals who live alone are only about 30% uh, of, of all poor people living alone. Whereas lone parents almost half, 47% of all low-income lone parents use a food bank. And it's almost as the large a fraction for uh, couples with children. 44% of all low-income couples with children use a food bank. Okay, next slide, please. Other findings, the number of food bank visits. One thing we found is that food bank households are an extremely diverse uh, group in terms of the number of visits they pay. 40% of all the households in our sample visited a food bank in only one of the four years, but 21% visited a food bank in all four years. 30% made only one visit per year in a year that they visited but then 22% made five to 10 visits and 16% made 11 or more visits per year. Next slide, please. These next two slides give you a, a picture of the, the issue of food bank uh, um, uh, visitation. What this uh, bar shows you is the fraction of our food bank households that visited in one or two sequential or three sequential or four, all four years in our sample. As you can see, the biggest group is 40%, but the next largest group are the 21% that visited in all four years. Again, this shows the diversity of people who use food banks. Next slide, please. This shows the diversity in terms of number of visits per year. 30% uh, visited only once in a year, but at the other end, we had, uh, five, uh, uh, f those who made paid five to 10 visits were 22% of our sample, and those who paid 11 or more visits per year were 16% of our sample. So again, a very diverse group. Next slide, please. Here's some of uh, the characteristics that distinguish uh, people who made differing amounts of visits. The number of visits is higher among couples, compared to singles and single parents generally. Sing seniors visit more often than do younger clients. Recent immigrants 
visit more often than do those immigrating 10 or more years ago or non-immigrants. Households with members who have a disability, which is about a third of our sample, visit more often than um, households who have a member with no disability. And we found that the number of visits is not strongly associated with residential proximity uh, to a food bank. What lies ahead? Uh, briefly, we've got three more years of data that will cover the COVID period that we're gonna be analyzing shortly. There's also a second paper that I haven't gone into in any detail here, but it was written with these data. Uh, Melanie Yin, one of our uh, co-authors, wrote a brief paper on the impact of the Child Canada benefit on food bank use. The, uh, the Canada Child Benefit was instituted in July 2016, right in the middle of our data period. And what Melanie did is to compare food bank use among families with children and those without that difference before and after the child benefit came in. And her results showed there was very little change in food bank use um, after the uh, child benefit came in. So although uh, the incomes of families with children went up, their food bank use went down by only a, a very small amount. We interpret this as being the fact that there's so many unmet needs uh, in such households, such low income households with children, that um, the extra cash had many other uses besides the food and most of those households continued going to food banks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. Joanne, you work closely with Martin in, in terms of trying to get gather these data. So why don't we, why don't we turn it over to you next? So first of all, you know, the quest to achieve community-based research has been a long road for many food banks, including FoodShare. In the early 90s, this is kind of a cool kind of piece of information. As food banks began to organize in Ontario, we would meet all over the place, in church basements, anywhere there was a space where we could gather and talk about what the heck is going on in each community. And I remember this so vividly. As a, a food banker would walk into the room, there was 12 of us, by the way, now there's 1,200. So during that point, someone would walk into the room and they would, when they would walk, before they sat down, they would walk toward this large writing pad of an easel and we would uh, pick up a marker and write three things, our name, our city, and our number. And that number was the amount of unique people who were going hungry every day in our communities. And never did that number leave our mind during our discussion. Like in all that we did back then, we knew that that number was absolutely key. It was central to first understanding how we would advocate to change the condition of hunger. And then secondly, as the numbers grew, it would be especially important in understanding the capacity of our own organization to serve the number of people who are going hungry in our own communities. So it, back then, uh, stats weren't that great. In the early years, it was main, mainly ad hoc things like uh, people would come to a food bank and they'd sign in on a sign-in sheet so we would know how many people. In Hamilton, they had a very particular way of doing things. They used recipe cards. So I asked them as in the quest to actually figure this out. I said, well, okay, when the recipe card's full, what do you do then? Well, you know, we just add another one behind it. Okay, not very scientific, but it, it goes to show you that these ad hoc ways you're collecting data and none of it was really usable back then because you really needed something. So some people gravitated to access programs, some actually did a, an Excel spreadsheets, but I knew without access to electronic data collectively on the front lines, we would never be able to pull the data we needed to confidently talk about hunger, let alone change it. So research and understanding those statistics was so very important for us so early on. That led me to a wonderful opportunity to work with the federal government who are actually promoting a program called HIFAS that was an electronic intake program for the shelter systems in our province. So, you know, I invited myself to that meeting and I <laughs> thought I would speak to the HIFAS coordinator to wonder if this program that's designed for the shelters could work for us. When the conversation was over, we were eagerly taking part in uh, a program to uh, institute HIFAS in every food bank in Hamilton. And I was thinking within a few months, man, we'll be pulling data. This was about 10 years ago. We'd be pulling data and we'd be off and running. It didn't actually work out that way. Uh, we stayed at it for a number of years, but the program was just wrought with so many kinds of challenges in securing the data we needed, accessing the data for food banks. And it was the kind of challenges that 
well, they just couldn't be rectified. So I was so disappointed at the cost of amount of time we put into, we had to start all over. And I, and I finally thought we were there. Ontario, uh, Feed Ontario was also interested in this program as we were, we were testing it out because it could have been the program that we use in Ontario. I finally had to say, no, it is not. It's just wrought with too many problems. The only good news out of that situation is everybody now from these, uh, you know, makeshift programs, now we're on the same program. So migrating them next to the next one um, would have been a little bit easier. So sadly, we had to leave that system. And what program would we go to? We just researched so many software programs until we landed on Link to Feed. After several meetings and tours on that software, we all agreed to sign up. But unbeknownst to us at that time, Feed Ontario, which is the provincial arm of hunger, was also contracting with them to make a use of it for all the programs in Ontario. So at that time, we backed out of that provincial system uh, of that system and decided to join the provincial system, of course. And maybe Richard, who's speaking next, can talk a little bit about if Food Banks Canada is contemplating maybe doing this across Ontario, pardon me, across Canada, because it would be pretty phenomenal. So going to Link to Feed was also an enormous commitment as FoodShare had, uh, had to resource an entire network of hunger relief agencies operating in our city. On top of that, we were the food hub for logistics, shipping and receiving. The responsibility to administer an intake program in our city would fall to us and we would all have to do the operational procedures, the protocols, the operational manuals, the launch go lives, all of that monitoring would actually fall to us. And, uh, you know, it was at a time when we were pretty uh, busy trying to figure out things as we were, were bringing more agencies on board. But this is why we fundraised and food raised also throughout the community to actually substantiate uh, those supplies we were sending into our community. So this program now where we collected the data on intake is the first is the first four years we sent to Professor Dooley Martin, who just talked about some of the outcomes of that data. Um, you know, when we delivered that report, uh, it was a pretty amazing experience to hear you, Martin, talk about it, because it's been such a long, arduous journey to try to collect that community data. And the road, you know, was very arduous with scant resources. Every food bank has had scant resources. You know, many times we would say to uh, food bankers would tell us there was an eerie similarity to the person actually giving the help and the person receiving the help. Both were worn out. Both were a little worn down and both were always looking for additional resources in order to move forward. Um, and what takes so long in getting community research together is the commitment to serve people hurting in our community far outweighed the reallocation of precious resources from access to food to access to data collection and research. So. It is quite a day to actually hear the stats come back and hear somebody as wonderful as Martin talk about those outcomes. But uh, for myself, I would say, you know, I got one more benchmark in this community that I want to talk about when we talk about research in Hamilton. And I'd like to share with you this promotion I did a while back that I'm bringing back. And it starts out with saying, food banks are the last stop before families become homeless. I tested this out at a community meeting. <gasps> I heard a lot of gasps in the room, right? And I couldn't understand. People are living on the margins every day at the food bank. And I couldn't understand what the shock factor was, you know, in this, these community rooms. So uh, some say maybe you should reconsider using it. It's pretty, you know, uh, you know, shocking. And it is shocking. But it's more relevant today now than it was back then. And we have the proof. Because of community research, here's what I'm able to say to you that through the access of over 5,000 unique households in one month, representing over 12,000 people, first we had to decide if we're gonna talk about the risk of homelessness to people who, who visit a food bank, then what standard and calculation, what formula would be used? So of course we went to the housing giant, Canada Mortgage and Housing Company, and they state if a household is paying over 30% of their total income in rent and utilities, then they are at high risk of homelessness. If they're paying over 50%, on both of those things, then that puts them at extreme risk of homelessness. So when we collect the data, we collect household income, how much it is, we, we do the income source, uh, we do by family composition, and we also collect data on expenses such as rent, heat, utilities, and, and hydro, all of those combined. So here we go, out of those unique households in 2018, the last year that we gave Martin to look at, um, we had 5,235 households. That represented, um, I believe, about 12,000 people. So of these people, 73% mar pay market rent. 
That was 3821 houses. That's where the trouble starts around the rent. Um, just a note that 73% now is going to almost 85% since 2018. But let's just keep continuing. So of all the people who might have been safe with that formula, only 14% of those households had incomes that were under 30% where they paid utilities and rent. That's only like over 500 households. And if you look at 35% paid um, of total income on rent utilities, 30 to 49% of their income, that made them at high risk of homelessness. If you are at 51%, that's another 1,900 households paying 50 to 100% of their total income on rent and utilities. That put them at extreme risk. So 86% of those 3,200 households who access a food bank in Hamlet in March 2018 were at higher extreme risk of homelessness. Not by food bank standard, but by the standard utilized by housing experts at CMHC. So given this information, since that info was collected, then in a, add in now inflation, the pressure of COVID, fear, job loss, job interruption, business closures, etc. I don't wonder why there are tent encampments dotting the landscape of many communities across our province, especially ours as well in Ontario. My wonder is it hasn't happened to this degree years before. Living in poverty is chaos. It's so exhausting. And at some point, it's not unreasonable to think a family or an individual could absolutely lose that battle with poverty financially and become homeless. We have a family shelter here in Hamilton. It's full waiting lists. Men's shelters at the max. Violence against women shelters at the max. We in Hamilton now are grappling with homeless population that is greater than the very homeless services marshaled to contain it. In our city, people are being sent to hotel rooms and that number is growing so significant, they just have nowhere to live. This does not shock me. I'm more angered by it than anything, but it's been a long time coming and it's been a cumulative over many years. Thousands of people living on the edge, invisible in those margins. People now in encampments living in a tent, it, 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 is there any wonder? In Hamilton, just the last, over the, I think, uh, the last time they, they tried to clear the, 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 the encampments out, over 500 people were living in tents. And they're constantly being moved with whatever meager belongings they were able to carry when they left their home. And these meager belongings are being, you know, removed with the tents in these public places. And they, they interviewed one gentleman about the experience. And he said it was like losing your life over and over again. This is not our social safety net. It is the alarming absence of it. So the two main drivers of food bank use is household income well below the poverty line and no affordable housing. Rent is just off the charts. So what we used to say instinctively we know is fact through community-based research. We can tell you through community indicators who's at risk of homelessness. Is it male or female? Are they seniors? Are they couples? Are they family with children? We can tell how many households and how many people there really are. This took us 30 years <laughs> so data in the past has been unattainable either because we didn't have enough time or the knowledge and how to collect the data or we didn't really have the ability to reallocate food resources for research food banks face the struggle every day and this is why it is so important that feed ontario and food banks canada continue to lead the community research-based hunger reports as not only do they educate but they give such an important provincial and national perspective on food insecurity going on, not just in our province, but across Canada. These reports for local food banks also give us a benchmark for local agencies to compare their hunger stats against provincial and national averages. It's important to know where you stack up in the larger picture and where on the hunger spectrum that you fall. So everybody's entitled to a basic living. Uh, not only is this a financial crisis, I believe it's a moral one, and it reflects Canada's failure to meet its legal obligation to ensure the right to food. That obligation is found in the International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which Canada signed on to. So we need to hold them to that. So it took 30 years to get here. Today, we have arrived. <laughs> so I want to thank I, IRPP and the panelists, as well as the participants. Um, thank you for the privilege of informing you today on our mission's work of working toward a hunger-free community. And finally, in closing, I will end my segment here with the same three pieces of information that jump-started my unyielding commitment in the fight against hunger over three decades ago. My name is Joanne Santucci, my city is Hamilton, and my unique number is 12,613. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Joanne. Richard, why don't you, uh, why don't you take us through um, some of your research and some of your research findings and, and inform us of some of the challenges that you see um, and food banks with food banks writ large across Canada? Absolutely. Um, if you can pull those slides up. So thank you so much, uh, everyone. And thank you, Joanne, for that. That's a really good, a really amazing, helpful local perspective. What I'm talking about here, because um, what Martin and his team study, I showed some very effective longitudinal data collection. What we publish annually at Food Banks Canada is, is a, a snapshot from a month of, of usage. And um, so what I'm showing you here in, are the key insight, insights from that snapshot, which the last, uh, these numbers that I'm about to talk about are from March 2021. So this also gives a, a more recent insight into some of the trends um, that, that were talked about in Martin's presentation and what Joanne is seeing um, and how they, how they reflect nationally. So, uh, and if people want to see the, the source for that report, the link is right there. You can come onto our website and you can see an overview of uh, some of the key, uh, key stats from that, that snapshot. Next slide. So as Martin mentioned, uh, in March 2021, we saw 1.3, over 1.3 million visits to food banks across the country, a third of them children. And as Martin had said, that's a 20% increase from two years prior. And two years prior was the last time we were able to do a complete, a complete count in March. Uh, because of the pandemic, we couldn't do a complete count in, in 2020. Um, but we were, were able to see some trends in that year, if anyone was interested. But overall, this was the first complete count we could do in two years. And this, this rate of increase is we haven't seen since the aftermath of the recession, both in terms of the, the rate and the depth of need across the country. Next slide. So Martin gave an overview of some of the key demographics uh, that's similar to what we're seeing nationally. So we, uh, if you look at the primary source of income, uh, the blue, we, we say social assistance, but that refers to the general welfare portion of provincial social assistance, regardless of the province or territory. Uh, the second highest is disability related income support, which is uh, 16%. Um, that is, uh, again, in most cases, we're referring to the uh, provincial, uh, the disability portion of provincial social assistance. Uh, job income is a third, uh, actually not a third, sorry, 12.5%, one, one in eight, I believe. 11% uh, are, are pensions. And then there's a, there's a, a combination of other sources like EI and um, the out, outreaches of the CERB, including the Canada Recovery Benefit, those constituted at about, uh, I believe, I have to double check the numbers here, uh, 8%. So the majority of clients across Canada are on one of two forms of provincial social assistance. What's notable and what we've seen in the last uh, decade or so is a, a steady increase of those receiving provincial disability support as their main source of income, accessing food banks and pensions. Um, those two uh, have been, uh, been markedly increasing on a consistent basis and, um, and it's becoming reflective of, of regardless of how the economy is, is doing and also pre-pandemic, this is what we were seeing, is, is more people who have a, a marginal attachment to the labor force or for those who are outside of the labor force having a harder time uh, meeting greater costs of living. In terms of household type, uh, as was mentioned, uh, single, single people represent the highest portion, 46.1%. Um, single parent families are the second. 19.4 uh, and couples with children are the third highest. Now, in the last year, in the last hunger count in March, we talked about two distinct trends depending on where people were living. In larger urban centers of 100,000 people or more, we're more likely to see uh, larger families, uh, two parent families with children. Uh, whereas in the smaller urban centers of rural areas, uh, food bank clients were more likely to, to be single people. Um, and next slide. And when we asked last year, what are the top brain reasons for accessing a food bank? We went with the, the items most frequently mentioned. Cost of food was mentioned most frequently. Um, and this is not surprising given, given the impacts that the rapid food inflation has had on people with limited or low incomes. Uh, and it's acutely felt definitely if you're on a fixed income such as provincial uh, social assistance or, or pensions. Um, the second one is uh, 
social assistance benefits too low. Well, that was the second most frequently mentioned reason. Um, and then the cost of housing, as Joanne kept referring to, is the third most frequent. Um, lost job unemployed or lower delayed wages, not enough hours of work were also frequently mentioned. Uh, key to note that, again, larger population centers of 100,000 or more, they were more likely to mention lost job unemployed or reduced hours of work or not enough hours of work as the main reason for accessing a food bank. Um, and then uh, in other areas, such as rural areas, are more likely to mention social assistance benefits being too low. Uh, but the main reasons people usually talked about, which came through loud and clear, was the impact of either their rate of food inflation, cost of housing, or low income, and whether that be because of job loss, pandemic related or otherwise, or because of the social assistance benefits they're receiving are far, falling far behind the rising cost of living. Um, for instance, uh, for those on disability support, when we did an average of the national disability incomes across the country, the average was just over $12,000 a year based on data from the Maytree Foundation, which is 10% lower than, almost 10% lower than what it would have been worth 30 years ago. And that is uh, taking general inflation into account. And, and that is, doesn't even consider food inflation, which we'll go to the next slide, please. So, because food inflation is, is so noticed, it's not a recent phenomenon. We look at this, this uh, chart, which shows median income in the last, I guess, 35 years or so, which is the orange bar. Food inflation, which is the blue bar. It's been outpacing median incomes for, for quite some time. Um, people living in poverty or low incomes have been noticing it for a while. And then the link, I believe, that was just shared in the chat box, shows a recent study by John Stapleton and his team that shows the, uh, the, the how far the Ontario works portion of social assistance has fallen behind uh, food inflation in the last 30 years or so. Um, the, the, as I mentioned, the food inflation is particularly felt uh, by those who are on, on social assistance or on any type of fixed incomes. Uh, and it's something that clients, food bank clients, as long as I've been involved in this research, have been noting for, for quite some time, but in particular since at least 2010 or 2012 is when I started hearing, when I've been doing this research, that, that the cost of food had been impacting um, their need for a food bank based on the benefits, which they had literally budgeted down to the last dollar. Uh, when you have something increasing in inflation that quickly, it's going to be felt quite markedly. And the last slide, please. So uh, in terms of the household type, it all depended, again, as I mentioned, depending on where you live, single person households were more likely to be seen in um, the smaller urban centers, whereas larger urban centers were more likely to be seen in two parent families. Uh, a notable trend we were seeing in the larger urban centers um, was, was due to job loss. Um, they were more likely to be racialized populations uh, and who were dealing, contending with the economic shock, which essentially magnified the systemic inequities that already were being faced um, by racialized populations and, and those in, in, in um, low income work. Uh, it's it's become it was pretty pronounced and so when we talk about the rate of usage, food banks and larger urban centers of 100,000 or more were more likely to see the rates of increase more than double uh, to before the pandemic. So you're looking at they might have been seeing tens of thousands or 100,000 clients in a given month before the pandemic. So a doubling of that usage within that period is is pretty substantial, which is why the urban centers have been particularly hard hit by the pandemic. Um, in those areas. And that is all I have. Thank you very much, Richard. Visha. Over to you, Vishal. You can take us through um, the next portion of the, of, of the presentations. Thank you so much. I just see a technical difficulty of my video being on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Guys, my name is Vishal Khanna. I am the one of the co-founders, directors for Saidam Canada, along with another co-founder, Mrs. Shubra Mukherjee. We started 10 years back with a basement of helping people. After research, we found that there's a little crack in the system where majorly people who are with disabilities or seniors have challenge to reach food banks. We started the service tentatively around 270 people at that point of time from our home in the basement in Mississauga. Taking it out slowly, gradually started, we were initially only doing Mississauga area. 
that point of time. And slowly, slowly, it picked up to be region of Peel. It didn't take much time to expand it to region of Peel because there were food banks in place, but our service was very different than normal food bank structure. It was like focusing on seniors and people with dis physical disabilities. And we, we started a program with delivering to their doorstep and working with them on seeing how culturally appropriate food can be given to them so sitting at home. It did not take a couple of years down the road, we started realizing that this is being going beyond and the need is becoming greater day by day. We happened to open up GTA wide services for seniors and people with disabilities. Then we opened up an emergency call system. If you are hungry, you have nobody open, give us a call. Number started increasing. We started from 270 people. We went GTA wide, then we went GTHA wide to start serving deliveries, working especially on culturally appropriate food. We started a small breakfast program with schools locally within community in Mississauga. And as the COVID hit, it became a huge structure, started coming to us from schools, our homeless program, our supporting agencies became, number went on unbelievably. Just to give you a small idea that how much was this impact, just to underprivileged children studying in Catholic and Peel school boards, we have just completing 125 meals served and it is still going on. Our homeless program in different cities is approximately over 800 people every week, just on that. And on a monthly number, if you go on in totally what we are doing right now, it touches almost 20,000 people. It doesn't stay up, stop, it is not stopping. When we started, we felt that it is just few people. You know, it is going to be fine. Just people, some need, some people may need help. It will be fine. And as and as we are, we are moving out, it seems to be that it is an endless journey for a lot of people, whether it is children, our parents cannot afford to have the breakfast to go, our homeless family numbers growing, our support to small organizations and our seniors, it is drastically, drastically increasing. On a regular basis, when we get the emergency calls coming in to us, and it is shocking to hear the statements, you know, I had Joanne and, you know, Martin and Richard talking about it, much learned ahead, but what we learned on a day-to-day -day basis on in information, that we have income, but we are unable to afford to buy groceries. My rent is higher, my utilities and my insurances, and my phone, I cannot do it. What's a single person, single mom, just a student. It is a challenging time for all of us. Very challenging. As we try to catch the numbers, as Richard said, Joanne, it is not stopping. If you see the structure of food banks who started whenever, wherever they started today, none of them couldn't say the numbers have gone down. It has been increasingly and increasing and increasing. From where it was just a cupboard of support for a week to take, it is becoming a need and necessity in day-to-day -day life. The inflation is killing people. Changes are needed. We all need to look into it very deeply. We don't know where will it stop. We need to think and come together to consensus to see what differences are needed to help them and to help us to make a difference. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Vishal. I, I want to invite all of the panelists to, uh, to, to turn on their cameras. We're going to uh, very quickly move to some of the Q&A um, um, part of the webinar because we're getting some very interesting questions coming through. But, but first, I, 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 I did want to, to, to uh, I've got a similar question for Vishal and Joanne, but I'll start with Joanne. Um, Joanne, you've been with Hamilton Food Chair for, for a long time. And, and, and what I wanted to hear from you is explain 
from your perspective, how the visitors that you're seeing to food banks and the challenges that they're facing, how has that evolved over the over time? As, as Vishal is saying that when somebody comes to, to actually come to a food bank and cross that threshold, you have to say as a parent, mostly if it's a parent or somebody, I can no longer feed myself or my family. First of all, that's a pretty terrible thing to choke down before you actually get in here, wherever it is you're going to get to that food bank. So that's the first thing. There wasn't a whole lot of support for food banks. So back then, everything was arduous. Everything was difficult. There was a controversy around everything. And now as food banks um, began to network with the city, began to network with each other and started using a system-based way of operating, it became a little less arduous and less hard. And I think that as we started to talk about food banking and talk about food banks uh, and, and actually getting a lot of, uh, you know, promotion around them, it became less and less a, a horrible thing to actually go to a food bank. It became a necessary thing. And then as food banks also started to evolve, that it wasn't just a day or two they were going. For some, it's three to five days, you know, and we are at Christmas now, right? There's a, additional problems there. There are additional supplies that need to, to happen from there. So I would say it was very difficult in the very beginning because everything was so new. Information was new. People were shocked that people were using a food bank. And now people are just a little bit numb to it. Uh, the uh, Our system itself has just improved vastly over the last 10 years. We have a fresh food policy we never deviate from uh, where there's, I think, over, I think we said at least 50 to 60%. We're at about 65% of the total food that comes in is really wholesome and nutritious. So we've changed our operation. We understand that this isn't just a glimpse in that month for a couple of days, that they're going to be going longer. And if they're going to go longer, we have to really ensure and make it our responsibility that what we're giving them is wholesome and nutritious. Now, when people do come, they're still a little shy. But I think because there's so much information around food banks and the need, it's taking a little bit of that. They feel it's their fault off their back. You know what I mean? So I think they're coming in with a little bit more understanding that there are policies and everything afoot that actually affect them. It's not really about other things that people wouldn't want to make it about. So I would think the evolution has been, we're a bit more accepted. Don't know if that's good or bad, right? But for the most part, um, people have a little bit more comfort coming through uh, um, as far as what to expect than in the early years. And, and everything we're giving to people too is, is way better, way more, more volume, more things. And we're also looking at other things putting into our system, like um, uh, hygiene products. Like we just did a massive thing uh, two weeks ago to get feminine hygiene products into the system. There are many people who can't afford it. So we're also adding things in that are also called basic needs. So hygiene products is another thing that we're going to be offering at the food bank, as well as shampoo and soaps that have already been in that system. So there is an evolution. It may be slight, but over the whole year, but it's been one long, hard battle to get to where we are, to really articulate and say the story of the people we serve. So I hope that's helpful. Thanks, Joanne. Vishal, you, you, you co-founded Saidam in 2012 with a mission to feed low-income seniors and physically disabled people who could not get into food banks. Uh, could you tell us more about how have your services evolved since then and where do you see some of the biggest challenges uh, you know, for your organization coming from in the future? Thank you so much, Colin. You know what? It is such a beautiful question, as you know, even Joanne mentioned right now. Our key thing before I touch the, your question is that people are more, now that the calls coming in, they don't want to get the information out. They said, I'm just in need. Can I get food? I don't want to go through all information sharing. That is just a scary part. And bluntly, can you help me? Yes or no? Otherwise, I'll go somewhere else. That's one part. People are fearing it. Second major part is when we started this 10 years back, we did not know that time because we were not, we were just an independent organization. Start started with support and with the community to happen to be. We, we realized that we have gradually went out to open seven days a week. We are open all seven days. And our telephone lines are open 24 hours. You can call me us anytime. Why was this came up was because the need did not stop anywhere. We went through region of Peel. We went through all buildings. There are 27 buildings in the region of Peel, every single door. Joanne just mentioned about beautiful, you know, fresh 
fresh produce program, PPE kits program, hygiene program, being delivered to every door. And it is becoming such a necessity where a senior call, just to share with all of you, Blue, just recent example, we were doing a fresh produce program delivering to our buildings. And a senior called me up and said, the moment I got a produce bag, I right away cut the cucumber and made a sandwich and eat it. I was so happy to see that. This is a senior 82 years old. Another lady called and said, I have not seen this kind of a produce for last one year. I've not seen them. Imagine your heart. Right now we are doing another program with different cities we work with. Region of Peel, Jor, we're trying to work with other, or even, you know, trying with Halton, Durham, Toronto. It doesn't wait anywhere. The moment it comes out that there's a culturally appropriate food coming over, there's fresh produce back coming along, there's dairy along with this, getting delivered to your doorstep, it's shocking. It's that, and references coming from children. Not only that it is, they're living in housing, we are getting the reference from. Reference are coming from children calling up, can my grandparent get a bag? Can my parents get a bag? And just a simple question said, if I've asked them sometimes, is it not that you can help your parents? I'll be blunt to ask this. They're your parents. The answer is very shocking. We are unable to sustain ourselves. We find it immensely difficult to carry in. We are living, uh, and one of, the, one of the family said, we are living in a car. We don't even have a place to live. That is why we come to you to take up food. And they're 92 years old. And they please get that. And till date, since the time we started 10 years back, me and sister, we don't see anything, as Joanne said. We are constantly and consistently, as a small independent organization, we are trying our best to pull up from everywhere. Because sometimes you feel, if it is your parents, grandparents who are out there, I was reading an article recently of a senior out away on London out skirts but have to leave their rented accommodation because they were paying $400. The new, new owner has come and he said, sorry, you have to increase the rent or leave the accommodation. Now they are homeless on the street. A person who doesn't know where to go now. I don't see that easy path. We may have good, wonderful stats to share. <clears throat> We may have a lot of information to bring in. And look at, look at one big thing. If all of us must see deeply, we have to see one part. Food banks were created for a support system to sustain so you can go back, maybe an income, a gap of a month or two to go on. Now, the operations have become so massive that all organizations, what I hear and see, has to have a structure must need people employed, not volunteers only. There's no more volunteer run and organizations. Regular fundraising campaign, regular food raising campaign. The whole system must have a proper structure. It is becoming an industry. It is no more a support system left where you can just go and have. Do you believe that in coming times, don't you see that part? It is leading where people will be saying the opening of food bank is an industry right now because sustainability is an issue. Every small town must have people. Every small town must have a food bank because every town, 400 people, 400 seniors per day are being added to our profile per day. From a support to an industry, it is already saying where are we leading to. Thank you. Thanks, Vishal. I have a question that I'm gonna I'm gonna start with with Richard. I'll, I'll invite um, either Joanne or Vishal to respond to it. But you, you, so you mentioned food prices, and we did share some some of the, the most recent statistics in food prices, um, 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 you know, in the chat box. But tell us, you know, what are we seeing, and and what do you know based on your research in terms of how 
um, um, increases in food prices affect food bank use? And then the question that if Joanne or Vishal want to try to answer that I'd have for them is also just in terms of the supply side, um, how does, you know, increases in food prices affect your operations? Um, so when we talk about uh, food inflation, it's, it's, we usually speak about it in terms of it's on top of everything else that's happening. So as, as has been mentioned, is the very low incomes people are living on, on social assistance, which are the majority of food bank clients, both nationally and locally. Um, and at rates of income that are, you know, in case of a single person on social assistance across the country, it's all well below the poverty line, well, less than half of the poverty line nationwide. So you have that on top of the lowest income quintile, which is the income quintiles, I guess, would be anywhere up to 25, 30K a year um, for most people or for the most population groups across the country. Most, I would say, well, well above 70% is spending more than 50%, which Joanne mentioned, that puts you at severe risk of homelessness. So the two things, food inflation on top of that. So we've referred to it in this last year as a perfect storm. You have three things going on at once. Um, and, and in regards to, so that, that is basically the impact because people are pretty, especially people in low income are, are, are experts at managing money. It is becoming increasingly difficult to do so. Um, one other thing I'll add is that, so the policy changes that we advocate for, that we repeatedly advocate for with every interview we do and that we've been talking about in every research report, this is basically to keep things manageable. Right now you're seeing this massive increase. We saw this 20% increase in visits with unprecedented policy changes, a massive reform, a temporary reform of the AI system, which has now ended. Um, so essentially what, uh, what, what people are seeing now is we need significant policy change to keep things from going out of control, let alone reducing the use at this point because of these, these changes in inflation and, and how just incomes can't keep up. Joanne, do you want to touch upon how it's affecting your operations? You know, when COVID hit, I think a lot of people didn't really realize there was also a supply chain slowing down until it actually stopped. You know what I mean? So first of all, prices all of a sudden were 20% higher. Everywhere you went, it was costing you 20% more to purchase that, that product than you needed to. And that's if you could get it. You know, the, the first six months of the pandemic was quite frightful because we had uh, uh, some food here, but we were just going to go out and buy more and you couldn't find it. You couldn't get it. They would promise it to you, but not really. If your timeline, like they said, it would take eight weeks to come in, it might not be another 12 or it might come in, but only partially. It was a really difficult time for the food banks as the supply chain started to slow down and then absolutely stop. It has improved since then, but there are stoppages and slowdowns as you go along. And the food that we're purchasing is costing way more than we usually would purchase. Um, and again, because of the, the need was greater, we needed to give out more food with each visit to stop people from lining up and coming more often if they had to, all around all the COVID. Uh, policy and procedures, but you know we spend around two fifty three hundred the year before thousand dollars on food because it would be married with all of the wonderful beautiful corporate contributions we would get in, and that year we spent one point two million. <laughs> so it was tough, uh, but it's lightening up a little, and we're hoping that uh, we'll get us through through Christmas, and all of our stuff is still going to keep coming, uh, and uh, by the new year we're hoping that the food might go down a little and at least it wouldn't be so hard in order to, you know, uh, make these uh, different food uh, supplies come in. Thanks, Joanne. I, I'm going to start to go to some of the questions uh, from the audience because we've got some interesting ones. And, mm -hmm. and the first one I'm going to direct towards um, Martin and Richard and um, Joanne and Vishal, you can, you can choose to respond to it if you'd like, but it is a very interesting question. It, it really builds off of what Vishal had mentioned when he talked about how it's, it's becoming industrialized, sort of this whole process of, uh, of, 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 of food banks and, 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 and their operations. Um, but the question is this, it's that, you know, food banks were intended to be temporary. They weren't intended to be permanent institutions. Um, given that they are um, becoming, you know, more permanent features, I guess you could say, of, of Canada's social safety net, um, should there be a consideration for um, 
potentially permanent ongoing forms of government financing for food banks, either at a local level or at a, or at a higher level. That's what I didn't want to implicate Joanne and Vishal in this question because I'm I'm going to pose it to Martin and Richard first. But I think it's a it's a very valid and legitimate yet really complex um, question to sort of ponder. I'm going to let Richard start with. He's got more of a national perspective on these things and a policy perspective than I do. Right. So um, as far as government support, it's been crucial, especially in the last couple of years. What we what um, what they see on the local level is the reality of what happens when when something like this occurs. It's, it's an emergency. There's and food banks have this established infrastructure in place. They've got the pre-established connections, and networks and people can access food quickly when needed. And, and oftentimes, as we know, we, people can't wait for policy to change to, to uh, yeah. when they're hungry. You need food right now. Um, that's a very present need. In many cases, food banks um, throughout at the beginning of the pandemic who had lost their traditional funded sources had, uh, perhaps would, would have had to close if they didn't get the government funding. Um, and that would have meant you know, tens of thousands of people without that immediate access to food, which we know is crucially important. So. And right now, as things are looking with, with uh, the cases and the new variants and so forth, it's, it's hard to say what's going to happen. Um, and the important thing and the priority is get uh, you know, food to people quickly. However, the primary focus that we advocate for is, is the income security reform. And that's literally to make sure people have money in their pockets to get those who are food insecure, not access to food banks. It's to... Uh, it's to really make sure that the, 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 it flattens the curve as much as possible when, when people are, are having to uh, or, or seeing their incomes drop suddenly because of this. So that is the primary focus of our work is, is advocating for income reform. Um, however, it's, it's really unknown what's going to happen in the next year. And, and the hope is that we can support the network as much as we can fill that immediately. I, I would just add to that, um, refer back to uh, the, the, the second article I mentioned in my presentation by Melanie Ian, where she examined uh, the impact of the uh, Canada Child Benefit on food bank use in Hamilton. And the message coming from that analysis was clear um, that the Canada Child Benefit, which did increase income of families with children by non-trivial amounts of money, led to very little change in food bank usage, which gets back to points made by Vishal and, and Joanne that we're talking about families with such substantial unmet needs that even a, <clears throat> a notable cash transfer increase in the form of say the Canada Child Benefit really didn't make much of a dent in the usage of, of food banks. So we're talking about <clears throat> the need for rather substantial uh, increases, increases in cash transfers, uh, which Richard mentioned. And certainly I, as, as an economist, that's my inclination is to, is to let people spend money, people know their needs better than anybody else, and to, uh, um, to rely as much as you can on cash transfers, but can we I, need substantially more. One, one more thing I was gonna add quickly, um, and I think Martin's research reemphasizes the importance that, because the, <clears throat> the Canada Shaw benefit nationally has, the research has shown from proof, uh, the Proof University of Toronto that it's shown to have reduced food insecurity. However, uh, food banks, and Hamilton saw that it didn't necessarily impact food bank use. And I think what that reinforces is, is the, the importance food banks have in adding to the research findings of other studies. It doesn't necessarily contradict them, um, but there's an important uh, 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 place for food banks and the people who come to them to, to lend insights that add, increase their depth of knowledge with, with the impact on policy reform. That isn't as straightforward as people might think. If I can just address maybe the industrialization comic, because that, that seems to hit a chord when people mention it, you know, and if we have to set up a system to actually serve 25,000 people a month, and that's what we're going to do. Yes, there is a great shame that our government should feel because of it, really. Um, but when we're talking about food bank usage, you know, in the very beginning, and Richard says this all the time, so I'm going to repeat it. In the very beginning, most of the people we've seen were people who are receiving government supports, ODSP, disability, or OW. And at that time, we would go to our, uh, we would go to the ministry, we would go to the provincial governments for us in Ontario and talk about the suffering that's going on in these communities if we could just fix it index it 
bring it up to a level that actually shows this is what it costs in each municipality um, to actually live the basics of needs and then index it and we're done. So we're, we're happy to keep going along until this gets done, but year after year after year, it just never happened. And then 90, 1990s happened and they just took 21% from these people. Like I know that anybody who has a good job, you take 20% of their income, they're making some fast calculations on how the heck are we gonna survive? Can imagine if you already had nothing and you're taking 20% of that meager income. So this is what Richard always says is there's no silver bullet anymore. So many people now have come into that circle of using a food bank. Some are part-time workers. Some are our grandparents taking care of grandchildren. There are so many different scenarios of why people are accessing a food bank right now that there is no silver bullet. And this is why it's complicated that only the will of the people can change that policy. So what we're talking about is policies that really dramatically affect people that are suffering in our own communities. How do we change that? And the only way to change it really, in my opinion, is to bring this community evidence forward. You can't dispute facts, okay? You can dispute opinions, but you certainly can't dispute the facts. So it's our hope that our community, um, our community research is helping to understand it locally while we feed that information up nationally to Food Banks Canada, who then combines it with another picture of what it looks like nationally. Vishal, you want to get in? Thank you so much. You know, I, I wanted to add to the last question you had before I go forward is that example is that uh, when the COVID hit, we were bombarded with uh, the nutrition program. This is my personal experience because we don't have uh, me and sister you're just a volunteer. And uh, I used to go at 3.30 in the morning, early morning to buy fruits for our breakfast program. I used to go personally to the food terminal to get it. I was buying a box of banana, which was, uh, the general was, gentleman was very supportive, the biggest banana supplier. He said, just for food bank, I will rate you between nine to 12 at the max, depending on the week to week. But this is my best I can do to help you guys because you're doing a good cause. Wonderful. It started rotating. And then slowly it became 12 to 15, 15 to 18, 18 to 20. And we had we were buying bananas up to $35 a box. Personally. And then I asked the gentleman, is this, will this price come down anytime? Because it's, I'm going out of my hands. We are actually, we don't, we are not a regular food bank. We're collecting a little bit, whatever to coming, and we are putting every hundred percent in this. He said, maybe in March, it may come down something, but right now I cannot promise you anything. And we had already committed to children. Now, March comes, April goes, May goes, the least was 25 to $28 a box of banana. This is one fact I just wanted to add on to it. Coming back to the other sector of it, policies, you know, I agree, you know, the, it, is, it is needed to structure the food banks because the needs are increasing. Volumes are increasing. But where is the true, true impact? Where is it coming from? What is impacting our policies and what is impacting the system? What is it that people who are, I, I, I happened to take an Uber one day, my car was in the garage and the gentleman looked to me very dressed up, beautifully, amazing guy. I said, and I have a bad habit. I'll open a conversation like, this is interesting. He said, I'm a director at a company in downtown. I'm just driving to my office doing Uber, just for a little income money. Example one, to have extra pie because there's no saving coming in. To Joanne's point initially, when she started, she did mention the ratio of income, the moment it goes, they're leading towards homelessness. Now the families doesn't have money to save for their emergency funds. They don't have money to even save for, they're just surviving. What is happening? Just recent example, very, very odd, but I want to mention this. This will help people to understand. It is the property prices, which is increasing, especially around here. So the, a builder bids up of 2,600 square feet homes in Brampton to be delivered in 2025. Not even now. There are thousands of people who want to buy that property, thousands. Police comes in, price is 1.7 million. Within no time, the builder sees outsides. He says, 
sorry, the price is 2.1 million. The same 2,600 square feet home. And now the whole 250 homes are sold. Do you think the people who bought 2.1 million dollars home to be getting it in 2025, we are going to live in that home or just rented accommodation? If it is rented accommodation, who is going to pay the rent? People who are at the income, what is looking at? The students who are coming in, whom? Who will pay for that? And ultimately what will happen? It will be a nearest food bank who will be impacted with the pressure of giving nutrition and healthy food. How much funding and support will it be coming to? Somebody like us, we are thankful that we are being now, after 10 years, we started getting some kind of a system of support work. But imagine, even if you're getting it, where are we leading to? 2,600 square feet home, delivering in 2025. A box of banana in 2020 earlier is $9 to $12. We are buying for $28 to $35. Just a thought for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Vishal. Martin, I've got a question for you. Yes. The question has to do with the, the, the food bank use data and the role of employment income or the role of those who, um, who hold jobs in food bank use. Do you, what do you see in terms of, of food bank users who have um, employment income and, and how is their usage different than, than other food bank users? Uh, first, Part of the answer is very few people report employment income as their primary source of income. Um, uh, that's less, that's about 10, 15%. And those people are the type of user that we see for one or two months, right? And then they leave. They may come back, they may not. Uh, and they tend to be, this by no means everybody, but they tend to be younger persons who have little employment income, probably lost their job, and because of their age and lack of labor force experience, don't have a lot of access to social assistance or to uh, employment insurance, right? So that they've got, when they're out of a job, they've got very limited cash income and they need to come for a food bank to, to, to fill their food needs, right? But once they get back, um, they get a job, then uh, their income is sufficient to at least really supply their food needs they leave our roles and they, they may never come back again, right? So uh, for the very small minority of our clients for whom employment income is their primary source of income, they tend to show up for a month or two and, uh, and then we don't see them. Uh, uh, the long-term users, people on for you know, five plus months a year, two, three, four years, those are the people who's uh, the, the roughly half of our households whose primary source of income is either, as Richard was saying, disability or social assistance, um, uh, Ontario works. Uh, and those are the people who tend to be on for our sustained clients. Thanks, I hope that's Martin. helpful. I have a question for, um, for Vishal, and you mentioned this earlier. Um, can you speak to the importance of providing culturally appropriate food for food bank users? You know, this, is, this came up over the experience of time for the last 10 years. When we started dealing with seniors and we started delivering to their doorstep, now, there are different people from different, they're immigrants, or maybe they're living in Canada, they came from everywhere. But at that age, they cannot have anything. They, they have been having a set life pattern of what they've been coming out. And now they feel that they need something which they can live with be happy to eat with. And we started digging and digging. We came up with this, that most of the seniors, not like I would not say our 100% families, but our 50% families prefer to have culturally appropriate food, whether it is kosher, whether it is halal, whether it is vegetarian and different sections of vegetarian concepts. I, I'm a Spanish, I'm a Russian, I'm an Italian. I would like to have this, I would like to have that. My bread is different, my milk is different, my cheese is different. I don't take this vegetables, I cannot have whole wheat, I need less. At this, and we, we are working on programs, we're trying to do that. And I think when it, it's a segment of age group. Youngers may be able to accept it, a chain because they eat more outside, they can have a burger. They don't have much choice than to go by there. But when it comes to seniors, it is very much needed for them 
because they are at home at 92, 94, 96, 88, 87. Crossing the street also is difficult for them to get anything. That's, I think if you look at otherwise, and that the purpose of service is to really give them that they can eat something which they love to eat will make their life much better and healthier. Because not only the food makes a difference, just not the food component, no matter what we give them. You maybe give them the healthiest food, but if they don't love to eat that, it is impacting their thought process, which is not letting their digestive system to work properly also. So having a right appropriate food also gives their mind a smile. The body gets that chemical reaction. They start feeling good. They enjoy it. Even a little bit of that, it makes them very happy. Thank you. Thank you, Vishal. Um, this is a question, actually, we've had um, a few people pose this question. There's more than one, um, but I'll start with you, Richard, on it. Um, since you mentioned the, the, um, the issue of, of income supports reform. And the question is, wouldn't a, 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 a universal basic income, an income whereby people would receive no matter what, um, wouldn't that help solve the challenges that we're seeing with food bank use? and ultimately potentially lead to, to, to not having people rely on food banks in the future? So what I, what I mentioned uh, earlier in the, in the conversation here is perhaps the best example of that, that we have the most prominent example is what happened in 2020 when people got um, uh, 2,000 a month deposited quickly in many cases, if they had lost work or they were eligible for it into their into their accounts pretty quickly um, because of the emergency at the time. And there we saw a significant decrease in usage across the board. So it did reduce the need. It didn't eliminate it, but it did reduce the need. Um, and then once that changed, it was uh, the, the usage started to go up again. Um, how, and what happened in the last year as well was that there was a certain percentage, I've been, we heard this across the country, that uh, because of these the changed income support system, so let's say the, the, the branches of the Canada uh, Emergency Response Benefit, the, the Canada Recovery Benefit, which it evolved to, and the others, they, um, they helped, I think, a significant number of people did not have to come back as often or at all. So it did help a certain group, but what we heard across the board was a whole new set of people needed to come, um, especially in the larger urban centers. And, and I think, so even though you made progress in one area, there was another, there was other gaps happening at the same time um, based on everything that was going on. And I think, I think what it comes down to is, you know, and then when we, then we have the cases of people with disabilities or the cases of seniors, we have health needs. So uh, even a minimum income that doesn't take into account in-kind health supports, doesn't take into account other things that a minimum income will not solve. Um, so, and that, that we're seeing a combination of things where ultimately the goal is to reduce the need. And so obviously it has been, I've, it has been what I mentioned before was significant policy reform, which would enable progress towards a minimum income floor, which we would recommend in the report. That is literally to keep stem the tide. It will not likely eliminate it in the short term. Long term, that would be great. Um, but in the short term, what we need to do is that we have to do both, just the, the really solid advocacy uh, to help people have the income they need and then provide the immediate support for those who need it. Martin, did you raise your hand there? Did you yes, want to? I did. I just wanted to reemphasize uh, our, the title of our paper is The Poorest of the Poor, right? What's driving food bank need, at least here in Hamilton, is the families that don't have enough cash income. To, to meet all the very basic needs of their family. And that's why they're going to a food bank. So if you want to say that our key policies should address key reasons for food bank use, then a universal income would be an obvious way to, to deal with the inadequacy of income that's driving food bank use here in Hamilton. I'd say it's not the only solution, but um, it's a sine qua non. I don't see how you deal with the need uh, for food banks among people in Hamilton without having major increases in, uh, in, in cash income available for the poorest families in Hamilton. Jo Joanne, go ahead. Hamilton was selected as a pilot for that basic income. 
I said, God, I can cry right now as soon as they ripped it from these people who had waited so long for a, a chance to just live. And uh, if you could hear just the joy of being able to provide a, yourself with a winter coat, this is what they were talking about. They were healthier. They were eating on a regular basis. They were actually looking, uh, getting into, uh, you know, uh, looking for jobs. And it just invigorated these people because they lived on so little even the basic income wasn't a lot it was lousy two thousand dollars a month you know what i mean but it was such a massive increase from what they were experiencing so i have a, a heartache when i hear basic income unequivocally yes i believe it will absolutely improve the lives of of the people significantly but it's not like we were saying earlier it's not the only way to go forward i think it might right the ship a little bit but we still got a long way to go. Uh, so I, I would say that uh, a basic income is absolutely what we need. And we also need a minimum income floor. However you phrase that, that's just for starters. And then we can look at tweaking things down the road, which is additional programs that are scalable and retractable as people become more successful as uh, they, they venture out uh, past their situation into employment. <clears throat> Vishal, you want to get in? And then I'm going to take what Joanne said and come back to Martin with a quick question after. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you know, I'd just like to quickly share before I go further, Walt, that I had a recent phone call from a young person, 29 years old. And he was in Ontario Works. He said, I had EI. From EI, I came to Ontario Works. I'm looking for a cash job, but I need help from Food Bank. Now, to the question of you know the income part of it, universal income part of it, what we need to really look into it deeper down, that what is that? Is it just the income portion, what a person needs to sustain is important? One. Two, besides the income, will there be a saving portion for the planning they could do so that they can be protecting in future if they loss of something? Is that not considerable, that part of it? And third, the most important is, whatever you plan, are you planning on the current situation or are you planning basis on inflation and changes which are going to come? I maybe give you $2,000 that we gave you, but I'll take you back and after a year. But the price, soaring price of buying a house, everybody, every family wants to have a roof, maybe a rented accommodation or a car or something basic needs how are we going to work on that is the key. Thank you. Thank you, Vishal. Uh, the question I have for Martin is, is so Joanne mentioned that, you know, Hamilton was selected um, by the province of Ontario to, uh, to be um, one of the city locations where they would run a, a pilot on basic income. And that of course was, was not, you know, um, um, carried out to its to its end. Um, a new government was elected, and then the, the pilot project was was eliminated. Um, but given the uh, the the scope of your data and the time period that your data covers, is there the potential for you to um, to 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 uh, track or to evaluate the impact of basic income on Hamilton food banks, given that very very short period of time that? that might have coincided with the data collection? There's two basic problems with that. One is timing. The, the data that we used in our current report were just up through 2018. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so we don't cover most of the time, even the short period when that pilot was in effect. More importantly, it was a pilot project, right? It wasn't, wasn't all of Hamilton. So the, the number of families that were on that pilot project that would show up on our data would would be maybe be relatively small. Uh, and also, um, we could potentially take a look at it by tracking people's incomes and looking for people who, who had increases in income consistent with that. But that assumes they continued going to a food bank, right? If, if one impact of that pilot is you went, you stopped going to a food bank, then we stopped seeing you in our data. So that's a, that's a long, <laughs> detailed answer to the question. It's really, uh, it would be hard to use food bank data to assess the, the impact of that basic income. The much better way to do it is what was planned from the start, and that is to follow families who were in the pilot versus a control group. 
and look at their use of all sorts of services, uh, you know, before and after they had that uh, basic income. As you indicated, unfortunately, uh, the current government uh, of Ontario revoked uh, that pilot, so we never got we never got to see the results of that uh, of that study. Thank you, Martin. Um, I, ha I have another question. This one's for for Vishal and, and Joanne. Um, it 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 talks about the the potential given that food banks, you know, in a lot of ways, like, like Joanne had said, they're sort of that that step in the ladder before you reach homelessness. Uh, um, um, but given that, and given that place sort of within the, 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 the broader sort of social, social safety net, do you think that um, there should be potential to including forms of extended services in and around food bank use and in and around food bank operations. For example, um, you know, one of the persons on our panel today um, um, or who couldn't make it today, you know, is, is the executive director of the Saskatoon Food Bank and Learning Center, whereby they have this sort of skills training component to what they do. There are other places that maybe have mental health components to what they do. Does that, um, does that resonate with you? How, how would you uh, respond to that kind of question? For me, um, you know, our job really is to do a great job at putting food out there for people to receive. You know what I mean? That's first and foremost. Uh, how, how the future is, the government has to actually take part in it. <laughs> right now, I think communities are bearing the brunt of the lack of significant activity that could pull people out of poverty or at least give them a an even fight you know what i mean as far as getting healthy again and and not having all of these worries in order to move forward so uh, i'd be open to anything that put money back into their pocket that increased rates that gave them some kind of an income i'd be the first one in line to uh to do whatever it took to do that but we know that there's there are different roles for different um different people, how they're connected to the food bank. So we know Food Banks Canada is really fighting the great fight at, at the national level of really understanding what do these, what do people need who are coming to the food bank? Because they're no longer just people um, who are on government supports. There are all kinds of people living in poverty. Some are entrenched in it. Some of our are, are part-time workers. Some are full-time workers, probably all at minimum wage. There are sick people. There are people on disability who cannot work. So there's such a diverse amount of people and how they come. It would take quite a, a think tank to put together what that would look like. And I think if the government just came through first and foremost with increasing that income floor, uh, I, I think there's some room to talk about what else the food banks can morph into and and assist in that help uh maybe richard can answer that more fully uh i'm not really sure vishal go ahead thanks you know what we what the learnings we picked up in last 10 years time and what we have started implementing that is that we have started a, a wellness program and mental health program for seniors we're doing it online right now we are working with as much as information we can get we are trying to put it together and we're dedicated team just to do a wellness programs for them. We are working on a few new reforms towards how and what towards a youth part of it. We're trying to see what is that they would need. Slowly, slow baby steps we're trying to take on this. But we started this, the wellness and the mental health for seniors right now. And it is seeing a significant response from the community on that. As you said, you know, as Joanne also said, there's a practical difficulty what food banks would carry. But yes, there is there is a need of a system of collaboration to bring in when somebody comes. Mind you, not everybody, but at least 30% of the people which are coming may benefit from that. But looking into this to make it happen for the food banks, it may need a significant thought process for the government to look into this. Why? Because the base route when the child is born and there's no owner to a child from a foster home, from a juvenile sections to the where they go up, there's a whole system that needs to be looked into, just not income. There are so many kids right now on streets, there are no claims of parents. They're, they're living on their parts. As they grow up, they're out. So there is a lot of things to be done. I agree with you. Yes, we can help, but is somebody else really serious about it to come forward 
to make a difference, to help, to guide, to support, and to stand along so that all of us can make a difference. Thank you. That's great. I, I'm, I'm just going to very quickly give everyone 30, 30 seconds to wrap up and uh, I'll ask this, this very short, concise question. Um, I think all the, you've touched upon it during this, this, this discussion, but you might want to sort of pick which one of your, your top answers you, you'd want to present here. But what solutions do you think will address food insecurity in Canadian communities? So that's the question. Um, Richard, why don't I start with you and then we'll, we'll go around the table. Thank you. So the three main things we're asking for now are a rent support program from the federal government so people can pay their rent. And this is something delivered and it comes source directly to the tenant. Uh, reforming our, uh, our EI system, widen the tent so more people can be eligible for it. And um, the last key thing is working towards progress of the minimum income floor. So people can both pay uh, the rent and eat. Terrific. Uh, Martin, you're up next. I very much endorse what Richard just said. <clears throat> I think I might change the order a little bit. I, I certainly advocate everything he proposed. Um, I just really think cash transfer programs are, uh, are the number one on my list for a variety of reasons, uh, primarily because I just think it, it it's at, the, it's at the top of the list for such a large proportion of families in terms of what's driving their need for food banks. But certainly uh, directed, specific directed transfers to housing or, or other needs, uh, reforms to uh, you know, employment income, all sorts of uh, such matters I also very much uh, endorse. Of course, and many of those income transfers are at the provincial level as well, right? So this is a, That's right. a key piece okay. here. Um, Vishal, sure. why don't we go um, to you next, and then we'll give Joanne the last word. I thought I would give the honor to Joanne. She's much learned and senior. I would be blessed to hear her first. Okay. You, you have the last word then. You big chicken. Okay, here's where I'm going. <laughs> you know what? Everything that Richard said is absolutely true. But I think about my own community, and I think that when children – or have long bouts of hunger or experience that, it actually can affect their cognitive abilities, their actual ability to learn. There is no, there's no reason whatsoever in a community that children cannot live up to their potential. So let's start with the income and let's figure it out from there. But people have to live, they have to pay their rent and they have to eat. We can do miracles after that, but we need some help from the federal and the provincial governments in order to get that far. And then food banks, Boy, they're a, a scrappy bunch, and boy, they're pretty creative. I'm sure we could come up with other ways that we can actually assist in, in, the, in the development of pushing people forward and being successful in their own community. Wonderful. Vishal, last word. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think Joanne touched the point I wanted to raise. Because the first thing was that we really need to look at, as I mentioned to you initially, 125,000 meals were served for children. If you're not securing our future, we're just putting band-aids right now. We need to look into our roots where our future our trees are going to come. Our future for Canada is going to come. We need to protect them, secure them and their families to take them forward, one part. Second part, there must be more opportunities for youth as they're growing in schools, not after in schools, there must be the programs, you know, which, which should be giving them some kind of a handy training that they can sustain themselves. That's very important. Schools must have some kind of an activities of apprenticeship programs or handiwork programs, skilled worker programs will help them to not go on drugs or go out. As we grow forward, the key element as of today's time in instant string, where you know, when you go to the hospital, they give you that, RV, right? What do you call it? That we put you in right away, right? So you don't die. The, the, the put the needle inside and some glucose is going in your body. Is that can federal government and provincial government today put a string to all the house owners who are buying the properties now to have a string attached to CRA's income? Can they do that? Before you get a mortgage of 1 million or 1.5 million, 
Do you have that income what you're getting? Can you can you block that? Why? The moment you block this, the property prices will stop. Right away, increasing will fall down drastically. Number one. Number two, the rental income, the right now, the students who are for which they're building because there are 180,000 students coming into Canada, they are paying the rent. Higher rent. They are dying. They're committing suicides. They're renting to our, our, our country, right? So that is the key element to stop right now. And then, as the learned people mentioned, if we can work on incomes for now, we'll make a huge difference. It's a lot of job to do, a lot of brain work. We are only here, all of us, to give our thoughts. There needs to be bigger brains, bigger policy makers to think and see what we can do to make a better Canada tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Martin. Thanks for everyone for joining us today. And thank you for my, for my wonderful colleagues for, 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 for putting this on and bringing us all together today. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, have a wonderful holiday season. And we'll, we, should, we should really bring everyone back to have a, a longer discussion sometime. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.